I think Netflix, you know, if you make a deal with them, they acquire the project. I think, I think people will be surprised for what they actually acquire independent films for. What kind of money are distributors paying for movies today? <laughs> you know, it, it depends. I mean, you could get, you can get a, a good distributor to come in and it's all about territories. How much term, uh, how long is the contract going to be? Um, you know, making deals with certain platforms or certain distributors looks really good on social media and at cocktail parties. But some of those deals can go 25, 30 years now and they pay, you know, couple hundred grand, maybe, maybe more, but what are they owning and for how long? And what does that limit your other sales potential? Um, you know, I'm a big fan of, of trying to sell films territory by territory. There are times where you get opportunities to sell them in a block where somebody will come along and say, we want to own 10, 11 territories and here's what we're willing to pay. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not. I think you have to look at both sides of it. You have to look at the long term or how long are they going to have it? You know, sometimes these, these awful financial offers come with 30 years on the other side where, you know, I'm 50. I don't, I don't need to be 80 to get the rights back, you know? So sometimes the lesser money per territory, if it's shorter term, three to five years, you know, could be more attractive. Every deal is different. You know, you may get every territory spending between 10 and $40,000, but there's, you know, ultimately 50 plus territories to sell around the globe. They take time. Um, a lot of them don't pay up front. Uh, a lot of them don't pay until they have it delivered and it's past QC. So, you know, just because you make a deal, you may not see the money for six months. People forget that. Um, so that's, again, why, you know, when you're an independent filmmaker, I think you have to look at the, the real picture. It doesn't mean you're not going to have something that just surprises the world and you just make a huge deal. That, that does happen, but it doesn't happen to everybody. So, you know, to be a blue-collar filmmaker and to be able to continue to do what you do, you have to, to keep that in mind. Um, I think you have to, you realize that the average deal is going to probably be five to seven years that a territory is going to come in. Um, are they going to pay 50% upon execution of the deal? Are they going to pay 50% upon delivery? That's, that's an attractive way to go where they're going to put up 50% upon signing. And then, you know, when you get to your sales agent, you're going to have a quality, you know, a QC version master that they'll be able to deliver and all that went through. So you're not doing it territory for territory. Once you have that QC that's passed, that show that's past muster, everybody's going to get that when they get it. But I, I know two deals are the same. You know, you can have one film where all of a sudden, you know, the UK or Germany is paying 45, 50 grand, and then China is going to pay 10 or 15. And then you can have another film where China's paying 35, 40, and then, you know, the UK is paying 10 or 15. I mean, it's, it's never consistent. It, again, it goes back to genre, big with genre, also cast. Does it fit what they're looking to do? Um, but, you know, again, as, as I talk about in the book, there's, there's 54 territories on the globe, 172 buying countries, right? So you have to realize that some of those territories are going to pay crap. They're going to pay five, seven, ten grand, but you do have some that are going to pay very well. And you, you, you have to break that down when, again, when you budget a film, I always think with the end in mind. You know, if I make this film and it's this genre and this is the cast I'm realistically going to get, globally, what is that actor or these few actors do in a film of this nature or of this genre and, and really break it down. Don't look at ask and take sheets that every sales agent's going to give you that tells you they're going to ask for 150 grand in Germany and accept 75 grand. That's never going to happen. That's, those are just numbers that they just provide these ask and take sheets. They're the same ones. It doesn't matter whose name's on them. They all look alike. Don't go by that. The sales agents will provide that for you to get your business. It's called an ask take sheet. And it's, um, you know, it's very rare those numbers even come close. Define a walk and talk. A walk and talk drama? I, you know, I, I don't even know if it's a real term. I've, I've heard it used by sales agents and distributors talking about, you know, films that, you know, you can look at something like Harry Met Sally could be considered like, you know, a walk and talk romantic comedy. It's, it's not an action film. It's not set in outer space or with green screens. It's, it's practical. Um, I think like You've Got Mail is a great example of a walk and talk. You know, it's, it still has the romantic comedy elements. Um, when we did Mistrust with Jane Seymour, that was, that was what it was, you know, it's a walk and talk drama. Okay. That's the first time I'd ever heard the term and I started hearing it more and more. I think, I think terms come and go, you know, but that's, that's my understanding of what it is. I'm probably wrong. I'm sure your viewers will tell me how wrong I am, but that's, that's what I understand it to be. <laughs> and are those the hardest to sell? 
they can be tough depending on the cast. So if if you're not selling action, you're not selling suspense, you know, something that's getting the heart going and it's it's a drama, you know, I you really need to push the cast. Um, you know, because you're asking people to, you know, you think about you think about the independent films that have done well and who's cast in them and what they are and um, you know, whenever whenever we're teeing up to do a drama, and we don't really do those much anymore, but when you tee up for them, it's about cast. It's really just about cast. You know, that's important. When you do an action film, it's more about, okay, we've got an action film coming. Let's think about some of these actors who are going to do well globally in different territories and why. You know, and action sells, suspense, you know, thrillers, those things do well. You know, everybody, they, they translate into every language. And something else to keep in mind. Yeah. Sorry, I'll... No, no, go ahead. You know, they Please. translate in, in, they translate in different languages, but there's something to also think about is when, when you do drama, you know, it's something I, I, I talk to people a lot about, especially now coming out of where we've been for the last year and a half. Do we, do we really want to deal with too much drama anymore? I mean, I don't know. And, and the question is, is does the world want what we consider drama? Do they want our drama? Do they want our problems? You know, drama comes with a lot of emotion. It comes with a lot of feelings. It comes with a lot of baggage. Doesn't always, it doesn't mean it's bad. It's, you know, it's what makes some of the great dramas. But I always, I always try to, to, to remind people, think about what we're coming out of. People have been living in their, you know, their homes or their, their dwellings for a year and change and they haven't been able to socialize much. They haven't gone on vacation. Take them places they want to go. Let them experience exciting things. You know, that never gets old. People want to see beautiful things and, and get excited. And, and I, th I think you can incorporate that in drama. But don't forget, you know, Always think about where the world is right now and what if, if you were totally detached from this film, completely detach yourself from it, think about the year you've just had. Do you want to sit and watch somebody else go through some drama right now? Totally for the drama genre. I love it. But I just think you have to be sensitive to the global climate when you're making certain product. But the Queen's Gambit worked. That God, was, did that work? That, that was that drama. That was just awesome. Would you say that was some action or no? Not, not really. But it, but, but it had sensuality. It had, it had some eroticism to it. It, it had mystique. It had edgier seat moments because of some of the the things that she went through. You know, with her addictions and dealing with her family drama and and her background. I mean, I think if I remember correctly, I saw it you know, over not a long time ago now. But I think she was a was she adopted or something. She was in an orphanage. Orphanage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of baggage there, but. They were able to educate an audience. And, and you know what I thought the coolest thing was, and nobody was surprised, is when they talked about the number of chess chess games that sold after the success of that film. And they couldn't keep chess in stock. You know, it became the hottest thing in the world. Everybody was buying chess. And I, I always, so obviously they did something besides being just such a brilliant execution of such a great show, is it, it got people excited about a new hobby. And, and that's a cool thing too, you know? And we could root for the underdog, even though yeah. she was kind of three steps ahead of most of the people there. Oh, she was, but so, she was the underdog. But in watching the chess games and, and the looks on the little the little tells and the micro expressions and things, and, and wondering, was this going to be the one that was going to take her down? Yeah, you know? yeah that's and, right. And all of the, um, you say pomp and circumstance that was around certain of the, the notorious players, and then sure. here's this, she's going to come in, you know, so... It was great. I liked I liked the janitor that taught her how to play. Benny was it? He needs a spinoff. He sure does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he really did. Yeah, I wasn't sure where we were going with him at first. I wasn't either. I was like, ah, it's a little creepy, and then I realized, oh, okay, okay, yeah, that's, yep. he's a good guy. I know exactly what you mean, but <laughs> yeah, it, it had that intrigue. But no, I think there's nothing wrong with drama. But I think during the drama, you have to have those those moments to breathe. And, and experience new things. You know, as a filmmaker, we've talked about it before, a filmmaker's job is to bring an audience to some place they've never been, never knew existed, is always afraid to have gone to, or always, you know, wanted to go. And I think in drama, you can still do that, even with some of the experiences or adventure that maybe a, a romance, a, let's say it's a, a romantic, it's not a comedy, but it's a romantic drama. You know, there's drama and, you know, maybe somebody's a widow or somebody is cheating on a spouse and they're, going through this journey of a new relationship. And that's, that's one thing Zalman King did very well. If you watch like nine and a half weeks, what made that in its time was, was what that relationship did between the incredible sex scenes, the thrill and the exuberation of that relationship and where it took its viewers in its time. And I think that's important to do. Sure. 
And there was romance in the Queen's Gambit. There was. There was. That's yeah. right. That's right. There was, yeah. you know. But there was also excitement and the mm -hmm. way, uh, and then I'll just close it there, but just the, the, a lot of the shots were, I'm not sure what the exact terminology is, but there are like these upshots of, of them following her upstairs and getting like this wide view of her sort of walking into a room. And, and but, but also, and you're right, and what was really cool about it is they took us places we've never been. And her journey when she became a professional chess player, the places around the world she went, and some of these incredible rooms and these halls and these hotels and... We got to experience that, especially during COVID when we were all stuck at home is when most of us saw that, you know? And, and even Schitt's Creek, you talk about a show that exploded during the pandemic. I mean, everybody was talking about that show early on in the pandemic. And, and you know, here was just this great concept of this, this very wealthy family that had everything stripped from them that had to go to this small town. But what, what fun, and that's circumstantial comedy. That, I think, translates a lot better than slapstick comedy because People can get that from all walks of life. Every language, that'll translate, you know. So I, I think you just have to be smart in picking your content. Just, you have to, again, we talk about how us artists are so myopic and selfish. You just have to take a step back and say, okay, if you were detached from this, realistically, how do you think this would be accepted? Take your passion, take your investment of your time or your, your, your talent away from this for just five minutes. And really think about how this would do on a global scale and why. How much money can filmmakers expect to make from streaming services today? Don't expect anything. I, I think every deal is different. Every situation is different. Um, there, are, there are some really cool streaming services or platforms that are popping up all the time that, you know, Tubi's a new one. Um, obviously, you've got your Netflix, your Amazon, your Hulu. You know, um, I, think, I think Netflix, you know, if you make a deal with them, they acquire the project. I think, I think people will be surprised for what they actually acquire independent films for. And people need to realize they pay that over, I think, two years. It's not just one big check. Um, and, and that's fine. That's, that's what they do. Um, you know, there are some, some AOD platforms that are, that are doing surprisingly well. I, I never say what anybody should expect. Um, I, I work with sales agents and distributors all the time that are working with films that have been dead, catalog, collect dust in a closet, haven't seen the light of day in 15, 20 years. They're throwing them on some of these AOD platforms and they're bringing in five to 20 grand a month just on like dead titles. It, and then you have stuff that costs a lot more that are recent and slick and they're not making a dime. There's, I don't think there's, there's really a, a guarantee for anything. Um, I, you know, I think that um, there are some really good streaming platforms out there. There's some, you know, obviously the, the more the merrier if you can get different territories different platforms you know they have some platforms now that'll get your your work out on you know you can make deals with some distributors will get your get your work out on 32 different platforms you know every major cable outlet including xbox and playstation i mean those are some really attractive things but how well do they pay um you know i i don't want to give you a number and say this is what you can expect because it what you know we always have to remember about this business is to hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and expect the unexpected. And it goes back to learning something new every day. You know, um, there are some streaming platforms that I've heard are just, oh my God, you got to get with them. And you see what the deal is and you just say, that's the last thing I want to do. And then there are some platforms that you've never heard of that you just say, I, I wouldn't be caught dead being affiliated with this. And then they say, well, sit down. Here's what our MG is. We're going to give you a minimum guarantee for one year. And then after the second year, you have first right of refusal. If you're happy with that, we're going to pay you, you know, 40% afterward. You sit there and you go, so wait, you're going to give an MG on a streaming deal for that much money? Huh. Okay. And these things, I mean, I get hit with these things every other day where there's the misconception of some of the bigger ones. And then there's this, I've never heard of you before, but you're willing to guarantee it. I wish I had the answer for you, but I, I think it's one of those things that every film Every film with a cast from every filmmaker is going to be treated differently in that. I just do. I just do. I don't think there is a tried and true number yet. There's too many new platforms popping up. They're everywhere. 